Hi, this is Yvette Francino, and I'm here today with Rick Davis, who I met recently at a Global Happiness Summit. We had a networking session and we were all talking about the things we were working on. And I talked about I was working on this podcast and he wrote a book. And so uh, we agreed that it would be great for him us to join forces here. And he talked about his book on my podcast and, and also what else has been happening with him uh, in, these, in this recent year. So take it away, Rick. Tell us more yeah. about your book. Yeah. Hi, Yvette. It's, uh, thank you for having me you know, on your podcast. And here's a copy of my book or the picture of my book rather is the Furnace of Leadership Development. And the uh, subtitle is How to Mold Integrity and Character in Today's World. And the book launched uh, last year on November the 2nd. It was a two year, a little over two year uh, project, the actual mechanics of it. But it's been in the works for quite a long time. My wife and my daughters had encouraged me to write a book. Uh, you know, I had recently retired this past May from Love and Fire Rescue Authority here in Colorado as a battalion chief. And I would have a number of people on the shift say, hey, you know, chief, you ought to write a book. You ought to write a book. Well, it came about in August of 2017. And we got connected with a, a couple ladies out of uh, Denver and went to a lunch and learn called Publish, Self-Publishing 101. And we came out of there and I said, well, I guess I'm writing a book. <laughs> and so the premise behind the book was I wanted to be able to share the lessons that I have learned throughout a lifetime, uh, starting in high school all the way up to, you know, when I did publish the book and, and share it with other people. And because, uh, you know, there's things that I have learned that, I want others to be able to avoid and also learn, you know, at an earlier age, some things that I wish that I knew, you know, when I was younger. And so that really was the basis for the book and, you know, and getting it out there. And I was targeting, you know, the, uh, the people who, you know, entering a supervi entry level supervisory, you know, up to about that, you know, five to 10 year range. People, I got a lot of questions. It's like, how in the world do I handle this? Or this person over here, you know, they're causing me a lot of trouble. You know, how do I handle this? Why are they doing that? And so those are the type of questions that I wanted to answer along with development, because I have a chapter that's specifically devoted to leadership development. I see. And so is it very much in the firefighting world that, that or does it apply to any kind of business leadership or even personal leadership? I mean, it, it, give, give, me, give me a little bit more about the style or the types of problems that you address in the book. The problems that I address in the book and the chapters, you know, they can apply to anybody across a wide range. I did not specifically target, you know, the fire service, although, mm -hmm. You know, I, I was in the Air Force and the Marine Corps as well. And so I've drawn from experiences uh, starting in high school and then the Air Force, Marine Corps, and then the fire service. Like, for example, I start in March of 1972 and I came home from school and I found my father dead on the floor from uh, his fifth and final heart attack. And I talk about, you know, how that impacted me. And later on in the book, when I get into you know, talking about uh, leadership development, I tie my Uncle Cliff into that and how he didn't step in to take over a fatherly role, but he certainly was playing, or I shouldn't say playing, he was leading from the uncle role and having a tremendous amount of influence in my life. So I really believe that the foundation of leadership is integrity. And that's the first chapter in the book is integrity. And I talk about that and I talk about, you know, some of the surprises that come along, you know, with it. And, and what I mean by surprises is I share a story in there from when I was in the Marine Corps and uh, I got selected for a special assignment. And when my uh, gunnery sergeant called me in, I thought, oh, cool, this is going to be really neat. And he says, yeah, Davis, he says, uh, you know, we're going to uh, put you in with the SACO unit. That's S-A-C-O. And I said, SACO, you know, that stands for Substance Abuse Control Officer. <laughs> and, and so that meant, 
that myself and another sergeant, we were working with the captain and we were the ones that were administering the urinalysis tests in our squadron. So, like, oh, yippee. Yeah. And I said, why me? <laughs> and, and he said, well, that's because we trust you. And he said, we know that you're, you're not abusing drugs. You're not doing drugs. You're not abusing alcohol. And so you were selected. And so I write about that. That's one of those surprises of integrity. That, you know, is that, you know, we live a life of integrity and not only at home, you know, but well, it should be across the board anyway, you know, but at work as well. And it stands out and it's like, OK, here's a job and it requires somebody of integrity. Uh, bang, you're it. But it may not be the most glamorous job there is. And so I built the book off of that and I follow on with uh, talking about, you know, trust and honesty. Yeah, because, you know, even from the business world, you know, we do business with those we know, like, and trust. And if we don't trust anybody, you know, we're, it's not going to go uh, very far in life. I talk about dealing with the organizational monsters and how do the organizational monsters come about? Yep, very appropriate uh, topic, you know, coming up here on Halloween, you know, at the end of the week. And why do they do what they do? And a lot of times, uh, there well, there's always a reason. You know, there's always a reason for it. And what I have seen is many times, you know, people are written off as the troublemakers, are written off as the black sheep, you know, of the company, of the team, of the department, you know, of the unit. Yeah, you know? and nobody takes the time, you know, to say, all right, hey, what's going on here? You know, what really is behind this? And I'll just target this one here for a moment because too many good people are written off as troublemakers when they're not you know they have strong leadership characteristics themselves they have a very strong skill set that they bring to the table but they could be a threat to somebody else you know in the hierarchy and it's easy then to tar target them give them a label and say they're a troublemaker and uh my time in the fire department as a battalion chief, you know, I had some of those people that, you know, had been labeled as the troublemakers. You know, in Yvette, what I have found is I would rather have five troublemakers assigned to me than 15 people who fall into the category of the fair-haired golden children. Because I know those five troublemakers, they want somebody to listen to them. And I know that when you listen to what they have to say, they're hungry and we can take them and we can develop them. And they are going to go so much further than the fair haired golden children that have been coasting through life. And then that, you know, ultimately tied back into the, uh, the chapter that I wrote on, you know, leadership development or, or personal. I wrote on developing others, but I also wrote on the importance of developing us as leaders. Yeah, that's very interesting. And that does tie in and align with the type of leadership that I told you that I, I teach and I'm very interested in agile leadership and servant leadership. And they do talk about that same concept of just the importance of listening and really um, understanding the person and the motivation and their fears and not uh, being dictatorial and just telling them what to do, but really kind of empowering uh, staff. And it sounds very similar into what, what you're saying here is the importance of not coming in with a preconceived notion that somebody isn't uh, valuable, but finding their value, listening to them and, uh, and understanding whatever fears or motivations are behind their actions as well. So uh, that's, that's great. Uh, you know, as we talked about too, that two of the main themes in this podcast have to do with leading, le leading a multiple or multiple leading a, a meaningful life and also connection, fostering deep connection. And I would say both of these tie in with that leadership theme as well. That is something we want to model as leaders, I believe is mm -hmm. living a, 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 a a strong example of a of a good life and of fostering relationships. Do you have any examples of connection in leadership of how you can how you can foster a strong connection 
to and and really use that to be a powerful leader. The best leaders that I saw throughout my career, and then I, I'll explain how I applied this, were those who took the time to get to know you. And that is simply meaning asking a couple questions because the further up somebody is in the hierarchy, you know, they may not know everything there is about you, but just expressing a genuine, genuine interest in your life, not a checklist thing of how are you doing? How are you doing? How are you doing? You know, like, which I've seen that, I've seen that play out, you know, and it doesn't work, but I'm talking about people who are genuine. And as I had determined that once I was going to be promoted to the rank of battalion chief, that I was going to invest in the lives of the people that were assigned to me. Yes, there's the technical aspect of the job, but there's people who are there. So what the habit I started right out the gate, and I was a battalion chief for 15 years, is I'd call up one of the stations. I'd say, hey, what you got going on? And I, hey, I'm going to be out. And they knew, every last one of them knew that I like to drink coffee. And <laughs> sometimes I was drinking coffee at 9, 30, 10 o'clock at night. And, but I'd go out to the station. I'd sit down with him over a cup of coffee. Sometimes, you know, I had information to pass on from a meeting. But the majority of time, it was just a, what's going on? How are you doing? You know, what do you need type of a thing? And that established the connection with them. And when you establish that type of a connection with them, you know, that establishes and it builds on, builds on trust. And then you start to find out really what is going on. And it became evident to me, I'd say I was about a, in a year into being a battalion chief. And it's like, huh, this was an interesting uh, observation. About 45 minutes into me being in the station, you know, and, you know, it was just kind of, you know, a little bit of talk here and there. And I'd say, well, you know, it's about time for me, you know, to go. And somebody say, well, hey, chief, I got a question. <laughs> yeah. And then that would come out and they'd start, they'd start sharing things. But it took a while, you know, to get into that. Now, closely associated with that, uh, I, I've heard people say, I don't have time to spend with my employees. I don't have time to spend with them. You don't understand how busy I am. Well, I'm gonna give you three examples of people that were extremely busy, but they connected. The first one was Napoleon. He was the emperor of France and he had a reputation for connecting with his officers and with the troops. Second one was General George S. Patton. He visited the front lines in World War II where people were getting shot at. And the third one, I just finished reading a book on Winston Churchill. And from the time he became you know, the uh, Lord of the Admiralty in the early 1900s, all the way up to when he was a prime minister of World War II, he went out, he visited the coal mines, he visited the factories, he visited the troops, he went to North Africa and visited the troops. So when I hear people say, you know, that's just, that's just not in my wheelhouse, I, you know, I've got all these other responsibilities to do. I say, oh yeah, what about Napoleon Patton and Winston Churchill? Yeah, Three men there who were tied up with time, but yet they went out and they made that connection. So for the people who say, you know, I just don't have that uh, time to do that. I'd say <laughs> baloney. Well, now when we're dealing with COVID, we've got another challenge upon us because a lot of people are working remotely. And I know that it's not true with uh, in, in the firefighting industry that you, you have to get out there and be on the front lines. But for leaders that can't physically be with their people, do you have any advice Mm -hmm. uh, for them of how they still foster that strong connection? Stay connected through the phone and through Zoom. I had a conversation uh, with a friend of mine a week ago, and he shared with me that since COVID and because of remote working, his boss has not had any contact with him or the team whatsoever. Mm -hmm. And it's like, wow, that's unacceptable, you know, because we've got this technology right here, you know, with Zoom. So I, I still throw that back out there, you know, for the bosses who say, well, I can't do it. And now they're going to use COVID as an example. I'll, I'll say baloney again to that one too, because we have the technology to be able to connect. And then also find out which of those team members 
you know, are okay, you know, with having a face-to-face -face meeting, you know, take them out for a cup of coffee or, you know, take them out, you know, for, for lunch. I mean, we're, we're still able to do that. Uh, granted, you know, and on my friend, he had one person on his team that that particular employee, you know, didn't want to have any contact with anybody, but yet he maintained contact with that person, you know, via Zoom, the phone and so forth like that. But as a person above him, and, and this is, it's not fire department, you know, this is uh, in a corporation. So there's still no, no excuses not to remain connected with the people that are working for you. Yeah. So you've recently retired and as a leader, I know we talked a little bit about this, that transition can kind of feel strange. And especially with you being very close, we're here, we're both here in Colorado where the fires are raging. Uh, how, are you able to use your leadership skills now that you're retired in your personal life or how are you? What are the lessons that you've learned uh, over the years from leadership and, and that can be applied even in your retirement life? Yeah, I still maintain contact with uh, several, you know, from the fire department. We'll take time, we'll sit down for a cup of coffee and, you know, and we'll, we'll just, you know, chew the fat or ultimately conversation will lead to, you know, leadership or career development. Uh, my company is called Impactus, Cultivating Today's Leaders. So, uh, and I also became a member of the John Maxwell team. So I'm certified you know, through Maxwell as a, a coach, speaker, and trainer. So I definitely have a lot to keep me busy. You so know, you're still I, yeah. not really retired because you're just no. being more of a consultant and entrepreneur now. Yeah. yeah, retired was nothing more than a word to indicate my official separation you know, from the fire department. I've always maintained the, the attitude that I'm going to work as long as I, I possibly can. And you know, this ties back into the book as well, as I've been given some incredible opportunities throughout my lifetime. And you know, I, I have some very strong beliefs in God, and I'm going to be held accountable one day, you know, for what I'm doing in my life. And I, you know, I don't want the typical you know, Western idea of retirement, you know, you're done, you know, you go off and you hunt fish, whatever, you know, go to the ball games and so forth like that. It's like, no, you know, I, I have a, I, I have a duty and I don't mean it in a negative sense, but I have a duty to give back. And that's a failing event that I see. And a lot of people, when they reach that, you know, retirement age or, or even older, and they're, they're just sitting around and they're not doing anything there. You know, there's so many opportunities that are, that they are missing. You know, I hear a lot of people, definitely people my age or older, you know, they belly ache about the millennials, you know, they complain about them. They're this, they're that. Well, they're hungry. That's my experience. They're hungry. They want to learn. They want to know. They want some, they want to know that we are interested in them and they will listen. Mm -hmm. you know? And so for the people who are sitting around the McDonald's of America, you know, at eight o'clock in the morning, drinking coffee, complaining about, you know, the price of fuel, the price of insurance and, you know, government, blah, 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 blah. It's like, hey, get out of McDonald's and go look for somebody that you can help. Yeah. <laughs> you yeah. know, so from that standpoint there, yeah, there's, there, there's no, there's absolutely no retirement. Is there a transition? Yes. You know, coming out of the fire service, 37 years in the fire service, uh, there's a lot of camaraderie. Yeah, and I do miss that. And you mentioned the fires. And uh, up until uh, two weeks ago, this coming uh, Wednesday, I was doing pretty good. Yeah, and then when that Cameron Peak fire, you know, burned into our jurisdiction here, and I was meeting with a man, you know, I've been uh, coaching uh, with him, and he said, I got to go. They called us back to work. That's eight o'clock in the morning. And then it hit me. It's like, wow, you know, these are, you know, my brothers and sisters that I've worked with for so long. Now they are up there. And I had had the privilege and the opportunity to, you know, run our wildland program for seven years. And wildland firefighting is so much different than the structural aspect. And I really, I really enjoyed the wildland firefighting because of the challenges that came along with it. Uh, yeah, as we've seen here, it can continue to burn over large areas, you know, and, and just the structure and the dynamics and the challenges that come with it. And it's like, wow, 
and they're up there and I'm not. And so I, I was struggling with that. And fortunately, my wife recognized that as she was asking me, you know, how am I doing that? You know, she's been praying for me. I started to do okay until last Monday night. And uh, my daughter, she runs a cake pop business out of her house and they were making cake pops. So I needed to go eat supper someplace else because of the process going on here. And uh, went to a local restaurant. And as I was coming back home, well, hey, there goes three fire engines. And I pull in behind them and I look behind me and then there's two brush trucks and they're headed west. And I thought, huh, how ironic. I'm in the middle of a task force that's headed to the Cameron Peak fire. And it hit me, it was that, wow, you know, I'm not part of this. And as I turned off to go into my house, I saw that one of those fire engines was from the city of Pueblo, you know, down in Southern Colorado. You know, that's how many different departments are here. But it was, it's that dealing with that, you know, loss of camaraderie, you know, Yes, you know, I can get together and I can have coffee or lunch, breakfast, whatever, you know, with any one of them. But I think back to, you know, the great hockey player, Wayne Gretzky, and he retired and he was being interviewed by uh, Sports Illustrated magazine. And he was, uh, you know, lamenting some similar things. And the uh, reporter said, well, you can get into the locker room. And he said, yeah, but I'm not suiting up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's a it's a connection. You know, that, that loss of that connection itself, yeah. you know, that I ha I now have to deal with. Although, yes, I have my business. I'm a member of the John Maxwell team. And I do have a sense of purpose mm -hmm. you know, in my life. I, yeah. I still do. I haven't lost that. And that sense of purpose is to pour, you know, my life into others, you know, and provide that value to them, you know, and, and to, you know, coach them. And, and teach them leadership, come alongside of them. So that's that sense of purpose. But nevertheless, you know, that doesn't separate the emotional ties of camaraderie. Yeah. Well, uh, you, you asked, you sort of answered my last question before I asked. I usually end with, if you only had a year left to live, what would you be doing or what do you consider a meaningful life? And you've been talking in this last few minutes about giving back and, uh, having a sense of purpose and and your passion around that. And um, so I, I don't know if you want to add anything more to that, but like I said, without me even asking, I can see that that you are living the, the life. You're very intentional about living a meaningful life, um, regardless of whether, you know, that you're giving back, regardless of whether you have, you're working at the fire station or working for yourself, you're finding ways to share your expertise with others and, and help them um, gain the skills they need in, in, uh, in leadership. So uh, did you want to add any more to that? I think you summed it up pretty well. I've been very fortunate. You know, there's certainly been the hard times you know, and the trials and the tribulations in life. I had my first ride in a fire engine when I was three years old. <laughs> and I started hanging out in the firehouse when I was 14 after my father died. And so as I, at this point right here, I'm into, I'd say the third phase of my life. Uh, growing up, I had two goals. I wanted to be a firefighter. I wanted to be in the military. And so I was able to, 37 years as a firefighter. I served in the Air Force and the Marine Corps. And then it was uh, in 2012, I really just felt, you know, the prodding, you know, from, uh, from God that, hey, you know, you've learned a lot over the years. It's time to start looking towards, you know, teaching this, you know, full time. And yeah, it, you know, it, it took, that was 2012. So it took eight years. Uh, you know, there are a lot of, that goes on in between that time, but nevertheless, now I'm in that third phase of life. And so I've just been, you know, very blessed, you know, you know, the, hey, firefighter, military, and now I'm getting to do what I want to do. And that is, you know, you hit it. That's that purpose. And I'm going to continue to do it as, as long as I can, as long as I'm physically able or until, you know, death. Well, thank you very much, Rick. We really appreciate all you're okay. doing. And thank you so much for being on the podcast. Well, thank you, Yvette. I appreciate it very much.